Previously, we had introduced redox reactions, right? Uh, a chemical reaction where an electron is transferred between reactants within a particular reaction. Um, we can now take this concept and we can apply it to cellular respiration because, in fact, cellular respiration, not only is it a catabolic process, not only is it an exergonic process, but it is also a redox process. So this means we're going to be taking and moving electrons between reactants of this process of cellular respiration. So for example, on this slide, we see the summarized chemical reaction for cellular respiration. Right, so we've got our organic molecule, in this case probably glucose. It is going to react with oxygen, and in the process we're going to form carbon dioxide, water, and then we're going to release energy, which is going to be used, number one, to make ATP, and then some of that energy will be lost as heat. The way that we extract energy from glucose is essentially by removing electrons away from it, allowing those electrons to give up, energy until eventually they end up with oxygen in their lowest energy form, right? So in this case, because we're removing electrons from the glucose, we can say that the glucose will become oxidized, loss of electrons, to form carbon dioxide. And then the oxygen is going to be the final resting place for those electrons after they've given up all their energy, right? And so oxygen, by accepting the electrons, is going to become reduced um, to eventually form the water. Now, that might be a little bit difficult to understand um, or maybe a little hard to just simply remember. So there's another way that you can identify what becomes oxidized and what becomes reduced during the process of cellular respiration simply by following the hydrogen atoms. Right. So when electrons move during cellular respiration, they're technically not moving by themselves. They're moving um, in conjunction with a proton. Remember when you have one proton and one electron, essentially all you have is a hydrogen atom, right? Because simply a hydrogen atom is a proton in the atomic nucleus and one electron buzzing around that. And so what we can do is we can follow, okay, where do the hydrogen atoms, including their electrons, start and where do they end up during this process of cellular respiration. So if you take a look at glucose, right? Glucose is a molecule that is a rich source of hydrogens. There are 12 hydrogens here, meaning there are 12 electrons. If we take those hydrogens away, if we take those electrons away from glucose, all we are left with are carbons and oxygens. Hey, that's exactly carbon dioxide, right? That's what's left after we oxidize the glucose. Now the electrons have to go somewhere, right? And so we can follow where the electrons, technically the hydrogen atoms, end up, right? So they are eventually going to fall into the lap of oxygen to become water, right? So if you add hydrogens to oxygen, you end up with H2O, right? So in this way, following those hydrogen atoms, you can kind of identify where the electrons are gonna travel during the process of cellular respiration. Okay, so a little bit to review and then build, right? So in cellular respiration, right, glucose or other organic molecules are going to be broken down in a series of steps. This is a metabolic pathway. This is a catabolic pathway. The way that we extract energy when we break down these organic molecules is essentially by the removal of the electrons. We take the electrons away from glucose, and those electrons represent this stored energy. Now, if you're going to take away the electrons and this energy away from glucose, you want to make sure you hang on to them, right? Because that energy ultimately will be needed to make ATP. And so the way that the cell is going to hang on to those electrons that it removes from the glucose is by transferring them to what is called an electron carrier. In the case of cellular respiration, one of the main uh, electron carriers that is used is a molecule that's called NAD+. Now NAD+, is what is called a coenzyme. Remember coenzymes from chapter 8, these are going to be those organic cofactors. Now NAD+, is able to accept electrons. It's an electron acceptor. Um, and so it kind of uh, functions like uh, let's say an armored vehicle for these electrons, right? It accepts the electrons, it holds on to them, it keeps them safe, and it transports them to where they, their energy can be used to actually do work, or in this case, make ATP.
right? So as an electron acceptor, NAD plus functions as an oxidizing agent during cellular respiration. It helps to oxidize the glucose by removing the electrons away from it. Once NAD plus accepts the electrons, it actually becomes the molecule of NADH, right? This is the reduced form of NAD plus, right? So you can think NAD plus is the empty um, electron carrier or the empty armored vehicle. And then once it's loaded with electrons, NAD plus becomes NADH, right? And the NADH really represents the stored energy that eventually will be tapped to make ATP. Okay, so let's take a look at the chemical reaction um, that shows you how NAD plus becomes reduced to NADH. How does it accept those electrons from food? So this particular slide has two parts to it, right? Up at the top here, um, we have sort of one representation showing you in a complicated format, the chemical reaction of NAD plus accepting hydrogens aka electrons from food, and then forming NADH. Down at the bottom, this is a much more simplified version of the chemical reaction. So here we have the two reactants. Here's food, right? This is symbolizing essentially organic molecules, right? Typically organic molecules um, will fit the format, or sugars will fit the format of one carbon, one oxygen, and then the two hydrogens. And you can see that, you know, the carbon skeleton can be extended here. But so this right here is the same thing as food. And in this case, the carbon skeleton is a good source of hydrogens, good source of electrons, right? So here's a hydrogen and there's a hydrogen. So we're going to remove these hydrogens along with their electrons and give them to NAD+. Right? And in this case, we're going to then be left with a carbon skeleton minus those two hydrogens. And we're going to end up then forming NADH as it picks up the two electrons and then also a proton. So let's take a look at this right up at the top. All right. So here's NAD+. Plus. Um, now, NAD+, plus, right, this is the full chemical uh essentially skeleton for it. Don't have to memorize it, but do understand that NAD plus is that important electron carrier that we use in cellular resp respiration. And NAD plus is going to pick up hydrogens from food. Now, let me switch a little bit um, and draw this out for you, right? So um, in your textbooks and in my lecture slides, NAD plus is usually drawn like this. And actually, maybe let's make it a little bit bigger. Right, so here's our NAD plus, and you'll notice it has two little, two little divots there for electrons, right? And so it's going to pick up um, hydrogen atoms with their electrons. Now, um, remember there were two hydrogen atoms that were available on the previous slide, right? Um, so we've got two hydrogens, and each hydrogen right having the one proton in the middle and then the electron buzzing around on the outside looks like that right so if we have two hydrogens we essentially have two electrons and we have two protons right so the nad plus is going to pick up one full hydrogen so the electron is going to fit there and then the h here is going to symbolize the fact that it picked up an entire hydrogen atom Right, so now we are down to um, one of each, right? So we've picked up one electron and one proton, so we're down now. We have one electron and one proton left. The NAD plus is going to pick up yet one more electron, but it doesn't have space for the other proton, right? So we've gotten rid of this guy, but there's one proton or, aka hydrogen ion, oops, that should be a plus, hydrogen ion left over. Right? So if we go back now to the previous slide, right? NAD plus right here is going to pick up two hydrogens, but it can't fit both of the hydrogens, right? Or the full hydrogens. Can't pick up um, both electrons and both protons. So it only has space for the two electrons, those are going to go in, and then one of the protons to form the NADH, and then the one extra proton is sort of left over. Okay, so in terms of the um, NAD plus turning into the NADH, when the NAD plus picked up, right, the full 
electron and proton. We got the H here. And then when it picked up just the extra electron minus the proton, right, we have our negative charge here, and that's going to cancel this positive charge there, right? So if we were to erase that, we would end up now with just NADH, right? So if we t originally took the NAD plus, right, and we added two electrons and one proton, we end up with an NADH. Okay, right, so that is essentially going to be the chemical reaction for reducing NAD plus to NADH, right? We take these two hydrogens, give them to the NAD plus. NAD plus doesn't have full capacity for the entire two hydrogens, but it'll pick up the two electrons and one proton, and then the last proton sort of floats off into solution. Okay, so now the NADH represents this stored energy, right? Because it's holding on to these precious high energy electrons that we've just taken away from the glucose. How do we convert that energy of those electrons now to the production of ATP, right? So this is a hint to how essentially the last steps of uh, cellular respiration take place. What NADH is going to do is it's going to take those precious electrons and it's going to pass them off to something that's called the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is essentially a series of proteins that play hot potato with the electrons, right? Each step, the electrons get passed from one protein to the next, um, and each one of those is a redox reaction, and each time the electrons are passed down, they give up some of their energy, right? So the electron transport chain passes the electrons in a series of steps instead of this one big explosive reaction. And as the electrons tumble down that electron transport chain, really there's a molecule of oxygen or some oxygen waiting at the bottom of the electron transport chain. Remember, oxygen is very electronegative. So it's pulling these electrons down the electron transport chain, helping them to give up some of their energy. And as the electrons give up the energy, that energy is used to make ATP. We haven't filled in all the details here, but that's the essential concept, right? So um, cellular respiration, right, uh, it releases all this energy in the glucose in a stepwise fashion. It doesn't have to do it that way, um, but actually having such a controlled reaction allows the cell really to utilize as much of the energy from the glucose as possible. So let me give you a quick example, right? We could take, right? We could take uh, a, you know, a cube of sugar, right? Some glucose, and we could light it on fire, right? This would be one really explosive reaction that would release all the energy in the glucose at once. But most of it would be lost as light and heat, not very usable. And on the other hand, what the cell does is it takes that release in energy and it breaks it down in stepwise fashion, kind of like the uh, electric turbine, hydroelectric turbine that we had looked at earlier in chapter eight, right? It was a stepwise process in which the energy, original energy stored in the system is released one step at a time, being able now to light multiple light bulbs instead of just, you know, one big one, right? So your body does kind of the same thing. It utilizes the stepwise release in energy to make sure that it can um, effectively and efficiently use all the energy in the glucose. Let me give you one more analogy, right? Explosive release of energy versus controlled release of energy. You have a car, right? Car has a gas tank. You use that gas tank um, to travel, right? So let's say you released all of that energy in the gas tank in one explosion. Right, so light a match, stick it into your gas tank. How far is your car gonna get you? Mm, probably not very far, right? Maybe half a block if you're lucky as your car explodes. On the other hand, what your vehicle actually does is it takes a little bit of that fuel at a time, injects it into the um, pistons of your engine, has a small, really controlled explosion in the inside of the piston that pushes the piston down. That piston allows then the uh, wheels of your car to move, and now you can take that same gas tank and you might go 300, 400, 600 miles on that one tank of gas when you have this controlled release of energy one little step at a time. It's a much more efficient process.